I'm Dr Mangia and welcome to Hidden Science. This week we'll be asking the question, are we living inside a holographic universe? My guests this week are Dr Jude Curravan, who's a cosmologist and award-winning Hay House author, and Jazz Razor, who's a physicist and business consultant. But first, here's our Hidden Science roving reporter, Grace Willis. The scientific world are good at making claims that most people think are science fiction rather than science fact. But once in a while, these radical ideas are proved right and our whole understanding of reality has to be rethought. So how about this one? The universe and everything in it, including you and me, are a kind of hologram. This radical way of thinking explores the idea that everything we see and know as our 3D environment may be a projection of information stored on a 2D surface at the far off edges of the universe. This theory is backed up by the mathematics that describe black holes. It shows that although a three-dimensional object would be lost when entering into the void of a black hole, there would be a two-dimensional version that would remain on the surface in the form of information. In theory, the object could be recreated in three dimensions using that information, similar to how a hologram works. Exploiting the unique properties of lasers and the interference patterns they create on exposed film, it is possible to project a 3D image from a two-dimensional surface. Even more intriguing is the fact that every part of a hologram holds the information for the whole. No matter how far you slice it up, the whole image could be recreated from even the smallest section. Just like every atom holds the information to describe the whole universe, and every strand of your DNA holds all the information to describe you. With a hologram, the whole can be created from even the smallest part due to the way interference patterns hold information. Me, you and all this could be described as interference patterns and it's the way that we interpret these patterns which determines how we perceive reality. The evidence for a holographic universe is wide and varied and I'm sure Mangia and her guests have a lot to talk about. Back to you guys at the studio. Thanks for that amazing report on holograms, Grace. Now, both my guests today are really Renaissance people. I'll start with my first guest, who's Jazz Rizal, and he graduated both in physics and molecular biology from the University of London, before going on to Chinese medicine, business coaching, and much more. He's also the inventor of the Energy Diamond software, which has received support from the UK government's technology sector. Jazz, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for coming. Now, what exactly is a hologram? How do you actually create one? Well, holograms are um, a universe, really, in miniature. They have within every little part of them uh, a picture of the whole, everything around them. So an example is if you look at a fern, um, you'll find that the shape of the whole fern is actually reproduced on each of the little petals. And a tree really is another example of a hologram. You wouldn't think it is, but it actually is. It consists of a trunk and it consists of some branches. But then if you look at the branches, they themselves could be considered to be a trunk and they have little twigs coming off them. So patterns which repeat like that um, in different dimensions um, are holograms. They're a special class of a group of shapes called fractals. But that's not how we create holograms sort of in the lab or you know, the sort of things that are on our credit cards. How are those created? They're created using lasers and um, lasers and light uh, can actually capture information in three dimensions. There's something in the actual wave which can uh, capture information about um, the different perspectives that uh, one can have of an object. So you can shine two beams of light at something and they can literally capture two different perspectives, like one for the right eye and one for the left eye. And it's possible to actually encode that into a photographic film. And when that's actually done, your eye literally 
um, gets both those perspectives that those two beams of light had. So you get one from this side and one from that side. And that's what typically gives us 3D vision or stereoscopic vision. So it's a really actually quite a simple process. It's just two beams of light capturing two different views and just capturing it into a bit of a film that's specially designed to take um, you know, those two beams of light. So you're saying that information is, information is encoded. How does it get encoded? Is, is it at the interference patterns when you shine one laser and another laser? What's actually yeah, happening? Yeah, that's actually, you know, in, in a nutshell how it is. Um, when one beam of light mixes with another beam of light, the actual result is the, the full 3D image. Rather than looking at it from one perspective one and another perspective, those two perspectives are merged. And when you go up one dimension from a two-dimensional view of something, you end up with a three-dimensional view. So clearly, if you add two um, perspectives which are two-dimensional together, you don't get four dimensions. Actually, you get three dimensions. And that's how most 3D imaging actually works. You know, one image is two-dimensional, it goes to one eye. Another image, which is two-dimensional, goes to another eye. And that leads to your brain actually seeing things in three dimensions. So that's how we see those sort of holographic images that we see in the movies and everything like yeah. that. So it's mm -hmm. actually something flat mm -hmm. that's creating something that appears to us that's three-dimensional. But that's not all there is to the subject, is there? Because you mentioned at the beginning um, that every Everything kind of like has a sort of fractal with the information coded of the whole. Mm -hmm. um, people have extended that to the whole universe, people like David Bohm and things. Could mm -hmm. you talk about how sort of quantum physics and um, uh, is related to this sort of idea as well? The well, whole well light is a bit like DNA. In DNA, there's information about a whole being. And that same information is found in every single one of our cells. And you could look at um, atoms in a similar kind of way. Atoms are like the DNA of the universe. And if you looked at them close enough, you'd literally find their, their actual DNA. Um, and the DNA is in the form of a waveform of light, which is wrapped up in a nice circle or sphere. And we normally see these waveforms either as things like electrons or protons. They're really part, they're packets of waves. And um, when you look at them really closely, those, those waves within them contain information about the waves that make up every other atom and particle. So it's, it's almost as if that every bit of information to do with everything in the universe is all encoded in every single particle that there is. So in that sense, every particle is a carrier of information for the entire universe. And that's what a lot of holograms are like. If you look at a hologram really closely, you could chop it up into a dozen different pieces, but each tiny piece that you chopped it up into, you still see the original image, but just um, a bit fuzzier uh, because there's not so much energy available to you know, represent it. And atoms are no different. Um, they contain information about the whole universe. An uh, electron contains information about the whole universe. There's a famous saying that um, uh, when the... Uh, electron shakes, the universe vibrates. And, and it's a case of recognising that there is something that links all particles in the universe together. And it, it's down to the fact that, just like our cells as I said, contain DNA and impression of how we are in our fullness, each atom, each particle, even a photon within it has information about the entire universe locked up in it. And when the DNA expresses itself differently, we end up with the cells of the nose or the cells of the liver and so on. But it's just DNA expressing itself differently. And it's the same thing with atoms and particles. When the waves behave differently and they activate different parts of themselves, in one instance you get an electron, in another instance you get a proton. It's the same process and it's fascinating that happens with atoms and molecules. But the same thing happens with living organisms and it also happens with the universe. Even the functions are reproduced, you know, at all sorts of scales. So the um, holographic principle, therefore, is just as you to take a holographic film that looks kind of swirly when you look at it, not very interesting, and you, uh, and you cut up a piece of it, instead of just getting just one part of that image where, you know, that you originally created from bouncing lasers off that, that object, you actually get an image of the entire object. So it is with the whole universe, really, isn't it? It's the holographic principle where part of it contains the information of the whole. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what about uh, the people relate 
this concept of the holographic universe and they sometimes equate it with the ancient idea of the Akashic records. Mm -hmm. Could you describe a bit, a bit more of that for me? Well, if you look at the old style um, tape recorders and the magnetic tapes or even vinyls that were used to record um, you know, songs and uh, music, what they've effectively done is they've taken sound, turned it into an electrical wave, and then used that up and down motion to actually score onto a piece of vinyl the same shape. And then, of course, when a gramophone needle picks it up, it does the reverse. It turns those bumps, those up and down motions, into electrical patterns, which it then turns into the sounds. So it's exactly the reverse process. So um, the universe is fabric. The fabric of space and time is like one giant vinyl record. <laughs> And the waves I was talking about earlier, uh, from you know that are locked up within photons and electrons and things like that, um, how they get encoded and impressed onto that fabric of the universe is no different than how music is recorded onto a piece of vinyl, except on a piece of vinyl you're looking at a two-dimensional surface, but in the universe you're talking about a multi-dimensional surface and you won't just get sounds recorded, you won't just get light recorded, you'll even get consciousness, you'll even get thoughts and feelings in their own dimensions being recorded. So if you can imagine a multi-dimensional vinyl record then that's what the universe actually is and obviously if you read certain parts of it um, and it's not to do with just um, reading off a particular bit of space like it is on a piece of vinyl, you've got to realise that the universe you know, also includes time. So there are points in time uh, where if you were to read what was going on there, it would be very different to reading the same place at a different time. And in a way, that's how there seem to be records of everything that's going on in the universe um, recorded into the fabric. So it's possible if you stuck your consciousness needle onto the right point on the universe's vinyl, you could read what's going on there. And you could do it from within your own body because, as we've said earlier, um, every atom, every molecule in you, within it has encoded information about the entire universe, all space, all time, all consciousness. So if that's the case, each of us have got our own personal internet connection into all the Akashic records. And all we need to do is get present and centred enough, and that's the equivalent of the needle, and place ourselves into the current moment and we'll be able to have access to the the rest of the internet out there, which we, traditionally people have called the Akashic Records. So now we've got a sort of modern scientific equivalent of that mm. and a, a scientific analogy to that whereby we could actually tune into... So everything that's ever happened in time mm -hmm. will, is happening and will happen. Mm -hmm. It's all encoded everywhere. And what all we have to do really is sort of tune in and sort of see if we can take that information. Is that what sort of psychic people are doing it when they're sort of say they're looking into the future? Yeah, I don't use the word psychic or paranormal. Like a lot of people, you know, who've started to work with this territory, we've, we don't even look at reincarnation in the same way anymore. When you understand that there is no such thing as a traditional concept of time where it flows from past to future, but actually it's, it's like, just like a layer in the universe that you can move through. And just like I can move backwards and forwards on this floor and left and right, um, if I want to, I can take the stairs and go up and down. Time is no different. I can move sideways in time and through space, if you will, but equally I can take the stairs and go up and down. It's just another dimension. Now, when you look at it from that perspective, then you begin to understand that, um, you know, everything's accessible in the universe. And I'll give you an example. Right now, there's somebody in New York um, doing their thing, have, maybe having a conversation, maybe having breakfast or something like that. Now, they're 5,000 miles away from me, but with a phone call, I can start talking to them. And in a similar way, it's no different with space and time. Um, it's right now, in parallel to this moment, there's a war going on located in 1945. OK, that's like, you know, 55 plus 13 years, which is 68 years from here, instead of 5,000 miles, there is somebody having a war. Now, it's perfectly possible, you know, with the right kind of instrumentation to actually plug into that time and connect with what's going on there. So there's no such thing as things that have happened or things that are going to happen. It's all happening. It's all going on right now in parallel, simultaneously, millions of lives all being lived at the same time. <laughs> so this, this new concept of the holographic universe in mm -hmm. science gives this idea that everything is happening simultaneously yeah. and we just have to, as you say, 
get into that space where you can actually tune in. I lo love the way you're talking about um, the needle sort of going on. So it's sort of tune in, tuning in and playing that information. Yeah. That's absolutely fantastic. It's like when people talk about TV, it's the same thing. There's Thank a dozen you very different much for that. Thank you, into. Jazz. And uh, join us again after the break when we'll be speaking with Dr. Jude Curran. <laughs> Welcome back to Hidden Science, where we're asking the question, is the entire universe a giant hologram? My next guest to help answer this is Dr. Jude Curavan. She's got a master's degree in quantum physics and cosmology from Oxford University, a PhD in archaeology. She's had a successful career in business as well and is the author of five books, most of which are published by Hay House. Welcome to the show, Jude. Thank it's you for coming. Great to be here, Manjia. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> no, thank you. Now, um, it, the holographic universe idea mm. is not just something that's in sort of esoteric realms and uh, you know people that maybe are on the fringes of science who are talking about it. There are Nobel Prize winners and that sort of Indeed, people there are. talking about it too. And and there's this uh, famous cover of New Scientist. This is going back a few years. Uh, you are a hologram, and the, the entire universe mm. is a hologram, and that's really come out of the work of uh, people like Professor Stephen Hawking, um, you know, to, as a seed of that. Could you tell us a bit more about that, that side of things, why mainstream physicists are, are describing the universe as a hologram? Well, there are sort of scientists that go back sort of decades, such as David Bohm, who really began to bring this idea into awareness. But I suppose the main push for this idea really became clear when folks were trying to understand what happens when a star becomes a black hole, what happens when it, it's through gravitational collapse, it's so massive that it pulls um, inwards um, to such an extent that light itself ostensibly can't escape. And the question was asked, what happens to the information? What happens to the so-called entropy of that star? Is it lost to the universe forever? Or does it survive somehow? And that was a major debate that uh, Stephen Hawking and others were, were taking part in and betting against and for. Um, but essentially what happened is that over time it began to be realized that actually, and I think this is very much the emerging perspective, that the information isn't lost, that it actually resides resides on what's called the event horizon of the black hole. And the event horizon is, for example, in a spherical black hole where a star's collapsed, it's that two-dimensional surface within which no light can escape. And the realization came about that you could actually, and this is bringing up quite a few threads together, but that you could actually model all the information, all of the entropy, um, in the three-dimensional aspect of the black hole as being on its two-dimensional surface. Now, before the break, Raz very beautifully explained what a hologram is and, and how we can uh, essentially have a two-dimensional film or a two-dimensional representation that when we shine light through it, we get the three-dimensional object appear. But it is counterproductive, it's counterproductive, even counterintuitive, that when we look to try and model all of the information that could have been lost within a black hole to find that it actually is proportional to its surface area, not its volume. And then the aha moment came, that sounds very much like a hologram. And so people like Jacob Bekenstein and, and others were beginning to model this, but it became much more than trying to understand the informational content of a black hole. It, beca it became a model able to describe our entire universe so that all that we call physical reality in the holographic principle is essentially um, information embodied, embedded within a two-dimensional surface, but from which the three-dimensional experience of, of our physical universe arises. So it, it started off really from what you're saying um, as an idea from uh, where does all this information go for, mm. in a black hole to well the information is it dis is it lost forever and then people start to say well is it on the surface mm. the event horizon of a black hole mm. um, to actually this concept that maybe the whole universe yeah. is like a projection yeah. 
from a two-dimensional surface so that everything that we're seeing around us, everything. all of this, is actually a projection. <laughs> <laughs> so it's quite an, 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 an amazing concept. Um, I mean, this is something coming out of mainstream science, though. Very I know much so. uh, Joe, uh, two of the Nobelist is actually involved in, the, in mm. this way of thinking as well. Yeah. But, um, you know, a lot of people listening to this will go, well, that, that's, that's just thinking. You know, it, are there, is there any evidence for this? What's, what's the sort of evidence in mathematics behind this? Well, the mathematics is very clear. And I think it's, it's, this is a sort of an emerging paradigm that's coming from a number of different directions. It's rather like, you know, the elephant in the room. Somebody's grabbing hold of the tail and somebody's got the left ear and somebody's on the, 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 the trunk. But it, the, the idea of the holographic model is coming from a, a number of dimensions. Uh, directions. First of all, it was trying to understand the informational content within black holes, but then it was coming out of string theory and the idea of, of a boundary of our universe called a brain, B-R-A-N-E, and, and the same sort of ideas. Um, the, 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 another one was trying to, you know, which has been tried to be done for the last 80 years to reconcile quantum physics, the description of the world at a very tiny stage, um, and relativity, and never the twain shall meet. If we go into the holographic model, the mathematics is beginning to show us a way in which we can find that reconciliation. And of course, when we study black holes, Again, that's the place, the very extreme environments of a black hole is where the sort of the two have been thought they could come together. But the way that it's happening is actually requiring us, instead of describing the universe of matter and energy and space and time, to really begin to see that information is more fundamental than, than, than those concepts. And it was John Wheeler, I think, at Princeton who said this very beautifully, that we really need to start to consider the physical realm as arising from mind. I mean, mm. Einstein talked about cosmic mind. If people can't get their head around cosmic mind, maybe because of computers, we're, we're becoming more and more familiar and comfortable with information as being more fundamental. But of course, when we start to consider information, it is a very slippery slope to consciousness. Mm. <laughs> and I know we, we want to really talk to you a bit Separate. longer about consciousness because yeah. yeah. that's a whole uh, another story. But, you know, could it be said then that we are basically living in a universe of information that's basically on the surface of a black hole that's being projected um, you know from this surface and creating this holographic universe is that the sort of could, could it, is that fair to say I think it is fair to say but perhaps it, it's it's incomplete in the sense that yes I, I think we need to stop calling about us of us living within we are intrinsically part of this coherent wholeness, non-locally connected oneness that is our universe of apparently three dimensions of space and one of time. The great thing about information is it can also give us big clues as to the nature of time itself. And maybe we could talk a little bit about that because Jazz's beautifully articulate perspective was really talking about multidimensional realities. When we actually co-create a construct that we call our universe, our physical universe, then there is a causality within that. There is an arrow of time within that, which information theory and the holographic model can perhaps describe more comprehensively and sensibly than, than has ever been done before, because most physics laws don't involve the concept of time. So it's not just about everything happening sort of simultaneously, that there is an arrow of time going at some level in the universe? Within our physical universe. I think Jazz would agree with me that, you know, once we get out of this physicalised construct of space-time, then time per se has a very different experiential understanding. But I would, I would sort of postulate, but it's more than a postulate because I think cosmology has really, uh, uh, you know, explained this. Within our universe, we have um, a fairly, essentially a universal cycle. We go back, all the evidence shows that this universe began as a very tiny first moment of space and time, but it began in an incredibly ordered way and has been evolving and expanding ever since. Now, when we start talking about the holographic model 
and that all of the information that is expressed within the universe is on its surface. If you can have a sense that from that beginning, ever more information is being explored, experienced, expressed within what we call space-time, it actually gives a quite a profound understanding of why the universe is expanding. Because the, the, the actual pixelation on that surface, that holographic surface, that tiny, tiny, tiny scale we call the Planck scale, each of which encodes one bit of information. If we're going to explore more information within the universe, we have to have an expanding universe to enable that to happen. The other thing is because it began in such an incredibly ordered way, entropy can only go one way. Right. That gives the arrow of time, but it's not just entropy. I think we're going to, uh, we think we're going to have to come <laughs> back to that after the break, but a fascinating okay. topic. Thank you, Jude. You're very welcome. So join us again after the break when we will continue with this topic of are we living in a holographic universe? <laughs> Welcome back to Hidden Science. Now, Jude, just before the break, you were talking about <laughs> entropy mm -hmm. and how that has a different take on time than um, you know, what we're told from relativity, which was that uh, everything's happening at once. Could you yeah. explain a bit more about that? Well, there are two different types of entropy. Back in the 19th century, uh, a guy called Ludwig Boltzmann created a beautiful, discovered a beautiful equation that described the entropy of gases, which is the number of states a gas can have. Think of entropy as a sort of order disorder or the number of states that, that things can have in a system. But in the late sort of um, 1940s or thereabouts, uh, an inter uh, a communications engineer called Claude Shannon came to the same equation but describing information. In other words, the informational entropy of a system is the number of bits or binary digits that is needed to encode a message within it. Now that is a really profound insight because now more and more physicists are appreciating that the gaseous entropy, the thermodynamic entropy, is almost a subset of the information entropy. But we've got a system, our universe, that began in a very ordered, very low information level and has been expanding and evolving and adding more and more informational entropy ever since. So that gives an arrow of time, but it also gives us a way of bringing in the holographic model to understanding that. What about Jazz, do you agree with this? Do you think there is both an arrow of time and a timelessness at the same time? And what, what's your take on the concept of information? Well, I think if you just look at the universe in, an in a, just in a purely material sense, you'd see that things have a natural tendency to fall apart. That's what people typically regard as entropy. Um, but here on Earth, of course, and probably in other places in the universe, we see examples of negentropy, where things are coming together, and they seem to have order, and they seem to have structure. And we have to ask, why is that? Why is, why is there some parts of the universe where the default in the universe is being overridden? No, and lush, yes, lush so um, where, how is it that order, in other words, comes out of chaos? What's making that happen? And um, for a long time, um, when I was studying molecular biology, I began to look at, at a molecular level, how do atoms and molecules go on to perhaps form into things like DNA? How is that possible? So there is some principle, organising principles, a lot of scientists call it now, they haven't put their finger on it necessarily, although the Higgs boson might have something to do with it. Um, there is some organising principle in the universe which seems to take um, disorder and turns it into order. And eventually, out of that order, uh, at an extreme level, you may even get you know, um, some kind of intelligence coming out of that. So it seems that at the physical level, there's an arrow of time. There's an increasing um, order in the universe where really the laws of entropy said that there should be disorder. Um, and uh, so this, this all has to do with, you know, the, the nature of the universe as a whole. You know, you've got time, timelessness, and everything is accessible at every level as well. I, I just wanted to talk a bit more about um, 
a, a different sort of tack, really, because there is a another aspect of this holographic idea, and that is kind of the, the whole universe is a kind of simulation. And um, somebody called Nick Bostrom from, I believe mm. it's uh, Oxford University of Philosopher, mm. has put this um, idea forward. I think he calls it simulation theory, mm. um, and uh, it, it's it's kind of like. Uh, the whole universe could be a simulation in the minds or a computer program of a very c advanced civilization, and if it is, we would never know. What, what's your take on that? <laughs> well, I think it's a fun postulate, and I really do think it was great of him to raise it. I wouldn't say it's a theory because, in scientific terminology, it would need a lot more, you know, context and support. Uh, to actually, uh, and, and evidence, to sort of move it along to being a theory. But I think the point for me is it, it, I'm not sure it takes us forward in really understanding what our universe is all about. Because if we go forward to the possibility of an advanced society um, being able to run the simulations, well, what about that advanced society? Are they the sort of ancestors of a yet more advanced society that's doing simulations? So we can play this, this, this game as long as we want. And I suppose from my own personal perspective, I'm really trying to understand at the most profound level, what is reality? You know, um, why is it as it is? And if we sort of, it's almost the simulation postulate for me, it's a bit kicking it down the road, it's like the can kicking down the road, rather than really getting to a, a deeper understanding. So do you think it's, it's almost like, uh, you know, giving the analogy of a computer game or mm. I haven't seen these Matrix films, I know everybody talks about them, but <laughs> you know, I think they're very, very popular <laughs> and I think, uh, do you think that it's more going down that road of science fiction rather than science? Well, fi science fiction often is science fact in the future, but, but my sense of this is, as you said, it, it's one that really doesn't advance us anywhere. And I think that's the thing about it. Whereas when we talk about what is reality and we're talking about the holographic model and we're talking about information and entropy and fractals, I think there's a, there's a, a really powerful body of both theory and evidence that's actually coming forward to, to suggest that that is where we can get a deeper understanding of the nature of reality. Fantastic. Now, Jazz, um, you're using computer software in a very interesting way, and I believe that sort of helps people tap into this sort of holographic information. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, um, as part of my research has been looking into how to work with the mind and how it affects the body. One of the things that I started to do was look at how people get healthy with regards to their purpose in life and how that relates to the wellness of their body. And it, there's an intimate link. So I spent a lot of time looking at how to coach people around that. And then I got so many requests. In the end, I thought I need to encode myself into some software so that people can do this without me necessarily being there. And uh, I actually wrote some software. And I discovered an interesting principle to do with energy. Um, and that is that many people would say that energy is gathered around wherever you put your attention. It follows your intention. And um, I adapted that a little bit. And I said, well, actually, energy gathers around learning. Um, clearly, if you're being ignorant <laughs> and you're not paying attention to things, things tend to fall apart. <laughs> you know? So obviously, when you start to learn things and you put things into um, action, you find things um, form an order that's aligned with your purpose. So I thought, if I want to find out how to help a person really manage their energy in a way where they felt alive and they felt they had purpose, and maybe even extend that out to other people, all that really needed to be done was somehow profile how they were learning. So I designed a little questionnaire which asked them about how they were learning, what they were learning, and who they were learning with, and their, their skills around that. And I just asked them to rate themselves on how well they were doing in each of these areas. And uh, obviously the results from that, the numbers that they put in, the ratings, it's possible to take them. And in a paint-by-numbers way, you, you can literally put them on a canvas, those numbers in the grid. And in a paint-by-numbers way, you can turn them into colours. So, and you so end up with yeah. a heat map of that person's learning, but it's also really a heat map of their energy and you know, their intelligence at that point in time. 
So where can people actually see a, a visual of what you're talking about? Uh, they can go online. Uh, the website is uh, energydiamond.com uh, or they can go just to my own site which is jazzrussell.com and they'll find a reference there and they can just write to me and I'll be happy mm -hmm. to send them a link to get their own image of their own inner landscape of their own mind and their own intelligence. So how, how does it how does it actually help them then if, you, if they've got this heat map as it were this sort of how does it help them in their lives? Well I've often told the story of <laughs> if you're sitting at a restaurant and you're having food and some something gets actually stuck in your teeth like spinach or something like that you get on something on the side of your mouth and everybody looks at you really funnily and you think why are they looking at me strangely and the, you, you're not seeing what they're seeing but of course as soon as you go to the bathroom you look in the mirror and you go oh, I've got something here and you, you take it away <laughs> then you go back into the world and people treat you normally after that <laughs> and in a way our consciousness is like that sometimes we get stuff stuck in our consciousness and we don't know it and everybody looks at us funnily and we don't know why and then if we could just have a mirror where we could just go and see what's going on and we could adjust things then we'd probably have a, a better you know healthier interaction with the world and people wouldn't look at us so funnily either so that's really what my software does it's really creating a mirror for someone to be able to see into their own inner landscape and it's often like those images you see on you know, the, the weather, uh, where they're describing how things are moving, and it's a satellite image of the world. But this is a satellite image, if you will, of your own inner landscape, and shows what's going on in there, and shows even the weather patterns. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So, and, and well done on the fact that you've got the UK government involvement as well. Yeah, That's it's great fantastic. to get funding for these things. Okay, so we're going to another break now, and uh, join us again when we'll have more of the holographic universe. Welcome back to the show where we're asking, are we living inside a giant holographic universe? And here with me are uh, Dr. Jude Curavan and Jazz Razor. And uh, so there's something interesting that you write on your website, Jude, mm -hmm. which is um, that you are multidimensional. So you've gone through this very, very, very orthodox sort of um, path of being a physicist and yourself, Jazz, both, both studied physics. Um, what does multidimensional mean and, and how does it give you an insight into the nature of reality? Well, we're all multidimensional beings, I, I believe, and from my perspective. And, you know, science is now realising that we can't describe, let alone explain, physical reality without recourse to other dimensions. I mean, a hundred years ago, you know, things that were unseen were, were not being aware of, we're now aware of them, but we're now in a, a position where we're realising that to understand physical reality, we have to. Uh, have I, a wider I say multidimensional to people sometimes. And they <laughs> they think go, what? what I'm <laughs> saying is that I'm a multitasker. Oh you right, <laughs> oh, right. Do, do you ever get that? Um, <laughs> probably. <laughs> they, think, they think I can do the shopping and I can do the. And you of know, course you can. I'm, of course you can. <laughs> but that's what people think think that we mean. So I think it, it's somebody who. Um, has never heard of this concept before. What does it mean? Yeah, what does, what it, does mean? it mean? Because, of course, like you were saying earlier, string theory. Yes, um, I was saying string theory. Yeah, sorry, yeah. we were talking about string uh, theory earlier. It's 11 dimensions and all the rest of it. Some people think dimensions are strictly things to do with space and time. But actually, um, there's a guy, uh, Rudy, he wrote about dimensions. And uh, it was to take it was a follow-on from the book Flatland, uh -huh. which is all about how do you think in multiple dimensions. And it was amazing about Edwin Abbott, who wrote that uh, as a Victorian teacher. Was, he wrote it for children. Yes. But one of the things that it was said that was a real kind of eye-opener for me was that dimensions can also be any aspect of experience. So for example, smell is a dimension. Mm. Yeah. You know, yeah. hearing is a dimension. And if you move along a certain spectrum of smell or a certain spectrum of hearing, you get a different experience of reality. So um, anything which gives us information exactly. is actually, uh, that axis is a, a dimension. <laughs> And, and absolutely right. I mean, I started to, to experience, because I think experience is key, isn't it? Mm. 
so-called multidimensionals from mm. the age of four. And yeah. I suppose another way of considering is almost vibrational levels, frequency levels. And we talk about, you know, frequencies of electromagnetic spectrum, but mm. spiritual teachings have talked about other dimensions, other frequencies, other uh, vibrational levels so of experience. So these are sort of realities kind yeah. of overlaid on this overlaid one. Overlaid on this which one. string theory does discuss, but... Sort of, but, but it's in really a very in a different way. way. experience. No, yeah, and experience is key. So, yeah. for example, X-ray, uh, gamma ray, infrared, these are all different frequencies of light. And if you look at them, uh, the world through them, the world looks very different. But the world is actually a consolidation Spectrum. of all these different frequencies mm, yeah. through which we look at things. So even with our senses, you know, multi-sensory is really saying you're using all of your senses. And these, these things, these senses, they give us information. But what's really unusual about the senses is, uh, the physical senses, is they only give us information about the present moment and the present bit of space that we're in. They don't give us any information about the past any information about the future, but there are said to be uh, faculties within the brain which allow us to access and sense things in other time zones, mm. other space zones, other dimensions. Um, but in order for us to do that, we have to kind of let go of the physical senses, and then the brain naturally diverts well, to the other dimensions. Isn't that completely losing sense of reality? If well, we it's of... how you define yes. reality. Yes. I mean, yes. I think you know, children move into these different ways of experiencing it's naturally. You were four. So I was four. Surely... Nobody told me it was the wrong thing to do, <laughs> or as imagination, and, and I never told anybody else about it mm. for mm. years and years. And it wasn't that I was. You're in the wrong reality. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Come back to the Come, right no, one. No, Come back no, no. Yeah. Your little imaginary friends. No, no. <laughs> If you had told people, they probably would hold you back. That's the point, and, yeah. and I'm very pleased that I never <laughs> did. Um, but I think that's the point. You know, children haven't got the filters on mm -hmm. that actually limit themselves well, to this perspective. Well, people would say, well, as a four-year-old, you were just playing. You know, it, it's just your imagination. What, what, what makes you feel that these are actually different levels of reality that you were experiencing? Evidence. Because from the very, very earliest, I wanted corroboration. Because on one level, I was, you know, I, I, I experienced mystical, so-called, but supernormal experiences. But on another level, I was also at the age of four and five, beginning to study astronomy and quantum physics, for God's sake. So the, the point was, I, I, I needed to have corroboration. I needed to have evidence. So if I had a precognition uh, or precognitive event, it was the fact that it, it happened. Or if I had a telepathic experience or a remote viewing experience, it was that I could then corroborate it and get that experience afterwards. So you started afterwards. to test it. Yeah. At the end, so you became, like, we had a little <laughs> scientist dude <laughs> <laughs> quietly away doing these experiments to herself. Well, That's this, fantastic. This is one of the things yeah. I discovered that, you know, a long time ago someone said, a lot of what you do is a bit mystical, isn't it? And I said, I was a bit offended. I thought, <laughs> actually, I'm, and then I had thought about it, and I thought, I'm a bit of both. Where, And I, I, I summarised it by saying that, um, you know, a sceptic is someone who doesn't believe in anything until they see it, in terms of hard evidence in the conventional dimensions that we actually live in. But a mystic is someone who doesn't see anything until they believe in it. So it, it turns out that what we see and what we believe mm. are actually two different kind of realms yeah. of uh, experiential dimensions. I don't think I agree with you there because I think, um, you know, I had a Kundalini experience yeah. in medical school yeah. and, um, you know, it was a, it, I didn't believe in anything before that and not, <laughs> not anything mystical. Do you, do you know what I mean? And yeah. then I saw it for myself. The experience, the experience is the key. And all three me. of us understand yeah. that. But I, I it's the bridge. Experience is yeah. the bridge. But I didn't, I didn't believe unseen, in it. Yeah. So it wasn't sort of like that I believed in it and then I started to open up. Mm. I opened up and then I saw it. And you got like, zapped oh, in yes, yeah, basically. <laughs> but, but, but but I do... Sometimes that's one way of journeying mm. through yes. this process. Yeah. Some people do it that way. Yeah. They uh, open up and then they get the knowledge and they get the awareness. Other people do it the other way around. Mm. Some people have the awareness and that leads to them opening up. Mm. But the reality is these two things work in a kind of a circuit. They're mm. complementary to each other. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes certainly experience can generate wisdom and knowledge and awareness. But of course, knowledge, wisdom and awareness can generate experience. It goes around the circle. Yeah. They feed off each other. But in a way, the circuit has to be completed to some degree, doesn't it? I mean, in the sense that... So what completes the circuit? Well, no, in the sense that I, I think being open, and I think with you, it was like you were 
zapped into yeah. an experience that effectively opened you whether you liked it or not <laughs> mm -hmm. and there are others as you were saying where you know you're, you're at least a little bit open my experience with thousands of folks around the world is you're right they, they almost go hand in hand mm -hmm. if you can be a little bit open you'll have more exper experience that helps you become a little bit more open and experienced. It's a virtuous well, cycle. It's a it? virtuous <laughs> cycle. It, yeah. it builds and it builds. And, the, and that's what I meant by corroboration. Yeah. Because I was experiencing it and I was getting evidence that showed that, you know, to, to, to go beyond space and time, to transcend yeah. space time. Isn't it funny, though, how what the reverse does? which is, you know, people who are dogmatic, okay, that's what they do. They work with less and less experience and they work with less and less knowledge. They become fixed yes, in terms yeah, of the yeah. experience that they yeah. work with yeah. and the knowledge that they work with. And that's it. They, they're bottled off. Some people, you know, in traditional society, when you do that, you, you end up being called old-fashioned mm. because you're stuck in your ways. Yeah. But in a scientific realm, that's called dogma. <laughs> <laughs> and, yes, exactly. and it is scientism because that yeah. sort of dogma doesn't follow the evidence. Yeah. And if science is about anything, it ought to be about following the evidence wherever it leads. And the experience. And, I, I and I the think experience, yeah. yes. I you too, yeah. the, the first level of science is about observation. Yeah. And, uh, you know, little Jude <laughs> was, observing, little, way, but, yeah. <laughs> was observing much more about the reality yeah. than a lot of people. And yeah. why not? Because that is an observation. Yes. And I think there's a lot of children call them indigo, call them whatever. Yeah. But they have an expanded reality. Yeah. And why not take that, that observation, yes. as the first step of the scientific method exactly you know mm. because that's exactly. an observation as well and i feel that that's beginning to happen mm. because i think once you do open up um to, to scientific theories that that you know have to have what we call multi-dimensions they have yeah. to have supra physical dimensions to be able to explain or describe and physical the holographic reality. universe theory does, you that, talk, does that does absolutely. that uh fundamentally does mm. that then i think that is a mind shift in itself. I think that's a, a difference in perspective of itself. I mean, I, I challenge it to some degree. People always talk about, you know, what came first, chicken or the egg. In this case, you know, with science, you know, what is it you're supposed to do? Uh, are you meant to make observations and then, you know, create knowledge from that? And then maybe that redefines how you experience things. Um, again, I think it's a circle. Yeah, I experience I has to, you think, would come first, then you make observations, but yeah. then actually it all goes around in a circle. Yeah. And it's not about putting one or the other first, it's about just engaging in the cycle. Yeah. Can you get into the cycle yes. and go around it? Yeah. If, you're, if you're stuck in the cycle, that's a problem. If you're yeah. just stuck in experience, for example, yeah. and you never get any observations for it or knowledge, then that's not science. That's more akin to spirituality, where you might be just trying to immerse yourself in the present, for example. And that's not much use to anybody else. No, and, and so, you know what you were saying? I wasn't observing, actually. I was living it. Living I was experiencing it. it. So it yeah. actually boils down to, are we living in a holographic universe? Yes, we are experiencing it. Yeah. So there are people who are, you know, children or whatever, you know, you held on to the experience. Yeah. And you went on to, both of you, went on to have very grounded um, careers. And so it's not that it's either you're up in the clouds no. or you're, you're grounded, uh, you know, uh, uh, or you're grounded, you know, it, 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 you can do both. It's integrate, you know, yeah. a friend once said years ago, it's not integrating, yeah. it's integrating, sure. it's greater than the sum yeah. of the parts when you can bring those together. Exactly. So, yes, if you experience a holographic universe, yeah, but it's different to how the string theorists might take it, yeah. but we're coming into a new understanding today, which is fantastic. Very briefly, what, what, uh, how can people know more about you, Jude? Um, Manju, they can go to my website, which is www.judecurrivan.com. And you've got a new book out as well, haven't you? Well, my latest book's called Hope, which is Healing Our People and Earth. And I'm in the process of just beginning to write another book, but my latest one's Hope. And you, there's another one called Cosmos, isn't there? Yes, in, I think it was 2009 or thereabouts. I co-authored a book with uh, Dr. Irvin Laszlo oh, yeah. called Cosmos, a co-creator's guide to the whole world. And that really does, you know, basically its basic premise is, is the holographic universe. Oh, fantastic. And Jazz, you're doing wonderful work with your software, getting a lot of recognition. So uh, how can people find out more about that? Well, if they go to my website, jazzrasool.com, they find out a lot about the background to it, where it all came from especially the idea of not working just with what's visible, but working with the dark spaces in between. <laughs> Something I've coined as a movement going from networking to field working, working with your field. 
Um, so if they go to my website, jazzresource.com, they'll find a lot more about that practice, that mindset, and how I've actually put it into software, which um, is about to be tested globally to help people connect, you know, um, at that deeper multi-dimensional level. So mm -hmm. it's taking social media to a really deep level, a real level. It's trying um, to literally take um, the surface experiences people have in social networking and trying to get them to work at a deeper level where they don't just like what they're doing with one another, but they get to learn and actually make a positive difference, which is what a lot of people are looking for social media. They want it to grow up, they want it to make a difference and instead of just just, you know, yeah. making it about and something you, And like. you've got a book in the works as well, haven't you? Uh, yeah, the one that uh, I've been working on recently is called Sacred Blueprints. Um, but it's, uh, it's focusing on the idea that everything in the universe is uh, formed as a result of geometry. Yeah. Mm. And um, it looks at those geometrical blueprints. Right. And that's what it's about. Right, fantastic. OK, so we'll look forward to that one then. Thank you for joining us, both of you, today. So Thank you welcome. so much. And thank you for joining the Hidden Science Show today. It's been a fascinating discussion and I hope you can join us next time. So see you then and goodbye.